What should the person using a katana fighting against a person with a rapier do to not die and hopefully win? Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatory. So previous videos, which I'll link below, looked at the fact that overall, a person with a rapier, generally speaking, has a fairly sizable advantage in a one-on-one -on -one fight, essentially a duel, against someone using a typical katana of normal size. Fundamentally, this comes down to the two main points of superior reach and better hand protection. Okay, so the, the fact that you've got those two things enables you to engage the opponent, skewer them, before they're even close enough to be able to hit you. The second video we looked at, however, dealt with the secondary problem for the rapierist. That is, yes, you're pretty much, if you're equal swordsman of equal skill, even roughly, even if you're slightly inferior, most of the time you're going to be able to skewer that um, samurai or whoever they are, Ronin, using a katana with the point of the rapier. However, you have a secondary problem because that won't kill them instantly. And this is a very important point that we have to mention again before we go into this video. The fact that wounds with swords are like any other stab wound. Sometimes you can get stabbed or cut and it can nick an artery or go through your heart or your brain and you'll be dead. And that'll be the end of the fight pretty much quickly. However, most stabs and most cuts in most parts of your, parts of your body are not going to instantly uh, kill you and in many cases won't even instantly put you out of action. I personally know people who have been skewered by swords in accidents, and in at least one of those occasions, I think two actually, the person didn't even notice that they'd been skewered by the weapon. Um, and equally, if we look at modern crimes involving knife crime, for example, there are people who are stabbed multiple times and come out of it in the end okay and survive to live the tale. So taking everything that we've said in previous videos into account and the fact that fundamentally the rapierist probably has the advantage nine times out of ten against the person with the katana, um, what can the, we've already looked at what the rapierist can do to increase their chances of winning the fight and coming out of it unscathed or at least undead. <laughs> um, what can the person with the katana do to try and even the score and try and win the fight against the person with the rapier? Well, before I go into some specific, uh, specific techniques and tactics for this, I want to mention that fundamentally, this is the same question as pretty much anybody using any kind of sword against a rapier. And some of the advice is exactly the same as what you would have to do or think about against a spear or a bayonet or any longer weapon. Because the fundamental issues we've got here are, number one, that this is a longer weapon than pretty much any other sword except for a massive two-hander like that. Um, so this is pretty much the longest wearable um, sword that anyone's used in history. That's the first issue, is reach. And the second issue is the fact that it spends a lot of its time with its point online and in front of you, and therefore is a big problem uh, to skewering you. And even if you, you might be simply thinking, well, you know you need to get that point aside, at that point, the person can disengage because it's a rather back-weighted weapon that's quite nimble at the tip. So even if the person gets the point aside, you can redirect it to another place and put the point in somewhere else. Or even if they start closing ground, you can bring the arm back quicker than they can run forward and then skewer them somewhere else, like the crotch or wherever you need to, that will stop them from running forward, the head, for example. So these are the two fundamental things. How do you deal with the reach advantage and how do you deal with the nimbleness advantage? And just to reiterate, this goes for any sword against a rapier, for example, the Langmesser. So if you're using one of these, which absolutely is contemporary with rapiers and was used alongside and would have sometimes faced rapiers, as the katana would have done as well, what do you do with one of these or a katana against a rapier? So the basic tactical advice here is control of distance and control of the opponent's blade, okay? Because the two fundamental problems we've got here are one of distance and reach, the fact that the rapier has superior reach, and secondly, the fact that the rapier also is a very nimble weapon that's able to change lines, so even if you cross that weapon, it can change somewhere else. So firstly, how do we control measure or distance? And secondly, how do we control the opponent's blade and therefore what they can do with it? So the first issue of distance. Fundamentally, you have three distances, okay? You have out of distance, that is a distance at which neither person can reach the other person with their weapon. You might be able to reach their weapon, but you can't reach the person without closing in. Okay, so we'll call that out of distance. Then we've got 
uh, in a medium distance, a distance whereby both people can hit each other, okay, this is a kind of bridge, so if you imagine your safe bit of land over here, a bridge going over the river, and then you've got the land on the other side of the river, which is very close range, okay, um, which is essentially wrestling range. Now, fundamentally, it should be fairly obvious that out of distance, you're safe, okay, because the person with the longer blade than you can't reach you if you stay on that side of the river. As you're crossing the bridge, this is the danger zone. This is the danger zone where your weapon being shorter than theirs, they can hit you before you can hit them, okay? So this bridge to cross that river is the most dangerous zone. Once you've got to the other side of the river and you're in wrestling distance, the length of the weapon doesn't really make a huge amount of difference except for the fact that the shorter weapon might actually have an advantage because you're so close that if you're so close to be able to punch, knee, kick, wrestle, throw, all of these things, then a shorter blade actually might be more useful at this distance, either cutting, thrusting or using as a wrestling aid than the longer weapon might be. So at that range, and I often use the analogy of fighting in a telephone box, if you're fighting in a telephone box, a knife is a better weapon than a sword because you can multiply attack from different angles when the sword can't because it can't move in the telephone box properly. So at close range, clearly that's a good place to be. But we still have to get across that bridge. How do we get across that bridge safely to get to wrestling distance? Well, before we get to that, we're going to talk about the safe side of the river. So while you're out of distance, let's say our opponent with our rapier is over there. We're over here with our katana. Let's say they're 20 feet away. Should be fairly obvious that missile weapons and throwing our swords aside, at this point, we are both equally safe. Neither person can reach the other with our swords because our swords aren't 20 feet long and we can't hit each other. So you are safe that entire time. Now there comes a point at which you can touch tips of weapons. If you just imagine that the person holding the rapier and the person holding the katana come to a point where their tips can cross. Now at this moment, your, your blades can interact with each other but without putting a foot in with a lunge or a passing step or running forwards and some other type of transportation of your, of your body, you can't hit the other person in that moment. All you can reach is the tip of their weapon, okay? At this moment, you are still neutral, okay? Because you've got the same amount of steel crossing each other. It doesn't make a huge amount of difference that I've got a short weapon, they've got a long weapon. At that moment, it is only two swords crossing each other. Now, this is a really, really important moment because in this moment, you have the ability to bind against their blade and do things to their blade or on their blade against their blade without necessarily being in the danger zone. Now, clearly the length of the weapons is a bit of an issue even at this point because if, for example, we only had a knife, and the other person's got a rapier, I could cross my knife with the tip of their rapier blade, and we will know that in that moment, all they have to do is extend their arm and put a lunge in, and they might be able to reach my body. Whereas if I do the same, I can't do that with my knife. And that is somewhat of an issue with the katana, because if we've only got a 27, 28 inch blade, and they've got a 45 inch blade, clearly there is a point at which, with only one movement of the feet, they can reach us, but we can't reach them. But nevertheless, Accepting that's a fact, there is a fundamental truth here that when the blades are crossed, they themselves are equal. You have, whether it's one, two, three, four, five, six, however many inches of blade crossed, it is an equal bind at that moment. Now, when two levers are against each other, an interesting um, interplay happens at that moment, and that is that the longer lever is actually at a disadvantage to the shorter lever. And that is simply because if we divide a blade into three parts, we have strong, medium, and weak. The reason this is called the weak is because if someone else pushes against this, it manipulates the blade a lot. If someone tries to push against this, it doesn't manipulate the blade hardly at all because it's at the base close to where I'm holding it. So with any lever, the closer your hands are to the point that's being manipulated or pushed by the opponent, the stronger you are. Not only that, the katana's two-handed. Which means that the reality is, when a very long, and as it happens, one-handed blade comes against a relatively short and two-handed blade, this bind, let's say they're crossed by three or four inches, this bind is stronger 
than this bind. So at that exact moment, at that moment of crossing of your blades with you with the katana and then with the rapier, they're at a disadvantage in the bind. They might not be at a disadvantage in terms of reach or in terms of the speed they can disengage because they've got a long lever that, and the tip will move fast and it's nimble and blah, blah, blah. But in terms of crossing bind strength and leverage, the katana, the shorter weapon that also happens to be two-handed, is at an advantage. Even with the katana, you could make a compromise. You could hold it in one hand far from your body. And one advantage this would have is you'd still have an advantageous bind against the rapier in terms of the bind strength because you've got a shorter blade and a slightly heavier blade, it has to be said as well, with the point of balance a bit further from the hand. But you would be further from the body. So if they did make that step and that lunge, you'd have slightly longer to react. One of the disadvantages of having two hands on the weapon is it brings your torso straight more front onwards and hence also closer to the opponent's blade. So it makes you a bigger target, a wider target and a closer target. If you held the weapon out here like a sabre, your body is now further away from that binding point and you'd still have a pretty good bind. So there is a trade-off there and a decision, a tactical decision or a personal decision even, to be made by the person using the katana. Do you come in with an extended bind against the rapier with the arm stretched out two-handed or do you do it with an even longer reach one-handed? It's your choice. Either are going to be an advantage or a strength of mind against the rapier, but the two-handed one is even stronger against the rapier than the two-handed one and, sorry, the one-handed one, and additionally, by having two hands on, it does give you quicker and more nimble manipulation and speed of being able to change the angles of the sword and move it around more quickly because you've got that leverage. Right, so what do you do next? Assuming you've got that advantageous bind, I'm actually gonna switch from using the sharp katana now to a blunt bokken for <laughs> obvious reasons, I think, uh, because it'd be much safer for me to demonstrate um, and much better for both the swords. So. Um, here we've got our rapier. So let's say we've got a bind against here. You've got a moment at which you've got some contact and feeling against the blade. The first thing you must bear in mind is that if you apply pressure to a blade too much, that blade will naturally want to come around and bind somewhere else. So you'll be losing that contact for a moment and you'll either have to follow it around in some way and maintain contact, or if they disengage and come in somewhere else, you'll have to find a new contact. So, there's a, there's a subtlety and a feeling, and I recommend that you practice this as much as possible. You can practice this with a bokken against an epee, for example, or just with two sticks of different proportions, a long stick and a short stick. But once you get that bind on, there is a moment at which you feel you've got the advantage of the bind before you'll lose it and it goes somewhere else. If it does go somewhere else, as I say, you can either keep contact to it and turn it into a new blind, a bind, a bit like sticky hands in uh, Wing Chun, Kung Fu. Um, or if they completely disengage, for example, if they pull the blade backwards here, you could move in and make a new bind on the other side. So there's various different options. And these are covered and taught very, very well in foil and epee fencing, for example. Um, and, you know, and in kendo as well. So. There is a moment at which you've got this bind, at which you've got the advantage and you've got a lot of choices. Now, fundamentally at this point, there are two things, two main things, there's obviously lots of other things as well, but there's two main things you can do. One, and this is probably the most obvious, at the moment that you've got an advantageous bind, charge in, okay? So, if you have uh, got your weapon out here, and that rapier, that rapierist is looking for an opening with their point and moving their blade around. You can track them around with your blade. As soon as you've got an advantageous bind against their blade, don't hesitate, keep that bind and be prepared as you start to move forward. If they start to disengage, you have to be prepared to change that bind to somewhere else, wherever it needs to go so you don't get skewered as you go in. So say the blade's this side and I bind here, Ideally, at that point, what you want to be doing is passing footwork, sprinting as fast as you can, straight towards them to come straight in with your sword. This will give them the minimum amount of time to disengage their blade, or to defend themselves, or to run backwards, backpedal, whatever. Okay, so clearly, finding a bind and being ready to move the bind. So if I go here, if I start to charge forward and they start, their blade starts coming around here, covering in whatever way you can to keep the cover coming in and then hitting them at very close range. And I would suggest to minimize the chances of being hit by their after blow, the pommel, the cross guard, or the blade, the edges or points, 
Once you chop them in here, come straight into grappling range, wrap their arms, throw them, pommel them, do whatever, whatever you need to do, but hit them, then come in and grapple. But it's all based on finding this bind and the opportunity to close. If you don't do that, the close isn't gonna be safe. You've got to absolutely practice, whether it's against a spear or a rapier, you've got to practice finding this bind, finding that moment, finding the feeling, and then going for it. And knowing when you need to sometimes stop and go, nope, I've lost it, I need to go back again, <laughs> okay? So finding the moment to charge in is absolutely key and it will be based on you training it and you practicing it as to how successful you are. So there you go, the first option, fairly simple, would be same against a spear or any other longer weapon, bind and charge, okay, bind and close. I'm not gonna say this isn't without risks, but as I say, the more you practice it, the better you will get at it. And it's really actually all to do with feeling in the blade. Um, and I would recommend practicing, if you want to be good at this, practicing against people using nimble point centric weapons uh, foils and epées are particularly quick uh, it is in some ways easier against a rapier a rapier is longer than a foil or an epée but it's a heavier weapon and is slightly less nimble so actually this bind and charge does actually work better against a rapier than something like a foil that being said um, not to say that the rapier is therefore worse than a, than a foil or an epée uh, because the rapier is both longer and better at Obviously it can deal out cuts, uh, but it can also parry heavier weapons better as well. A foil is very difficult. I mean, I've done foil against Sabre a number of times and it's very difficult to parry Sabre blows with a foil, whereas with the rapier it's dead easy because the rapier's got more mass and is a bigger, heavier weapon. But fundamentally, um, bind and close. But there is another option, and anybody who's studied the HEMA sources for anti-spear or anti-bayonet techniques will know what I'm going to say next. And it is fundamentally based on the same principle of bind and close. But the weakness of simply binding and closing is that danger that the opponent's going to disengage their rapier. So if I'm a rapierist, I'm going to be fully expecting the opponent to try and get past my point and then charge in, which means that whenever I feel pressure on my blade, I'm very often gonna move it around and disengage to a new line and a new location so that they just run onto my point. And I can even buy myself time by disengaging as I move backwards. And that means as they're charging forwards, I'm charging backwards. Even if I'm not charging backwards at the same speed that they're running forwards, I'm still buying myself extra time because they're having to run that much further to reach me. So as a rapierist, I'm fully aware of the fact that the person with a katana or a messer or a longsword or a saber is going to be wanting to cross my point and then charge at me. Okay, so what can we do if we're the person with the short weapon? What can we do to mitigate and reduce the risks of them running backwards, number one, buying more distance, and number two, disengaging and attacking in a new line? Did you guess it? That's right. Control the opponent's blade with your spare hand, okay, in all sorts of ways. Now, a lot of people in Japanese martial arts, I think, are um, not necessarily familiar with or even approve of manipulation or grabbing of blades. But the fact of the matter is, it is in Kenjutsu, okay? So in armoured fighting techniques, we actually see katana used uh, like this, half-sorting, what long-sorders do all the time and is in loads and loads of treatises. Uh, we also find it in uh, techniques against knife or tanto. So we do find it in Japanese martial arts, but more importantly, we find it tons in European martial arts. And actually, if we're the katana user here, we need to look at those European sources because what were European sources designed for? Fighting against European weapons. And that's what we're doing now. And one of the problems is people that train Japanese martial arts only very often only trained to fight against other Japanese weapons. So therefore, when you find yourself against a rapier, you don't know what to do because you've never trained to fight against a rapier. So if you want to use a katana successfully against rapiers, train against rapiers. <laughs> and look at the techniques and treatises for fighting against rapiers, which are European treatises. So there is a big difference between a katana and a rapier, as is probably obvious. And we've spoken about some of the differences. But one of the differences is that this is a relatively broad and uh, acutely edged and very, very sharp cutting sword that I don't particularly want to grab, okay? Not to say that rapiers can't be sharp. However, we absolutely know that a very narrow blade like this can never have the edge geometry of a katana or a dao or even types of broadsword. It's always gonna have 
broader angled or more um, uh, obtuse edges, okay? So the edge bevel is always going to be a large angle than on something like a katana. In addition to which, they're just not really set up to be amazing cutting weapons. Yes, absolutely, you can cut with them, and there are cuts given with rapiers in most of the rapier treatises, but they're not great cutting weapons. Yes, you could put someone out of action with a cut, but for the purposes of this video, they are easier to grab. Not only are they easier to grab because they're a narrower, less cutting offensive blade, but in addition to that, because they're held point forward, they tend to not be moving around here like a side sword or a saber or a katana. So because they're not moving around here and because they're concentrating on this, weapons that do this in straight lines towards you are great at skewering you and are great at killing you, but they are also easier to grab as well. Something that moves in straight lines is easier to grab than something that moves in circles. Right, so grabbing. There are many, many ways that you can do it. Um, I don't have a partner to demonstrate with right now, but fundamentally you can grab any part of the blade, okay? You can grab the tip, you can grab the middle, you can grab the base. Generally speaking, the base is going to be less sharp. That being said, with many rapiers, they're so tapered at the tip, they're actually not very sharp at the tip either. So you can grab over the, either of these, probably better than grabbing the middle of the blade a lot of the time with a rapier. But you can also grab any part of the hilt, okay? And this is where more protective hand guards can actually go against you because there's more things to grab, okay? Additionally, you can grab parts of the person's body, okay? So if we rewind back to our technique where we're seeking that bind and we're seeking that close, okay? Initially, we're tip versus tip. We find that bind and we start to move forward. They start to disengage the sword. We can either transmute, transform the bind into somewhere else to keep the bind there, and or we can go for a grab on their blade as we do it, and therefore as we've charged in, we're now at a distance where we're holding either a part of their blade, their hilt, their wrist, their hand, their arm, so we've controlled their weapon, or we've controlled their weapon arm, same result, and our weapon is now free. And it doesn't matter whether you look at uh, Langmesser sources, longsword sources, rapier, small sword, sabre versus bayonet, um, arming sword versus spear. These are all in countless European treatises. This is the way that you deal with a longer weapon. You bind, you grab or wrap, and you close. What do I mean by wrap, by the way? Well, incidentally, another one you can do is if we've bound here and we start to charge in, you can wrap your arm over so it goes over the blade and under. So you're not actually holding it with your hand and it ends up like that. Control the person's blade. You can, by doing this, then disarm them of it as well, but that's less important than controlling it. You've controlled it, your weapon's free, you can cut them through the head. Right, so. I hope this has been useful advice. Essentially what you're looking at is controlling first of all the distance, then you're aiming to try and get to the other side of that river, um, across that bridge, and while you move across that bridge you're either aiming to manipulate and control and maintain the upper hand in that bind, or with your sword, or you're looking to do it with a wrap, a grab, whatever. Okay, so you've got to get from one side of the bridge to the other side of the bridge, you're safe on your side of the bridge, the dangerous part is going across the bridge, but there are ways you can do it safely, even against the longer weapon. So, just to uh, conclude, I would say that overall the rapier still has the advantage, and that is simply, basically, because they can keep moving away. If the rapierist is robbed of their ability to utilise space, move around, move away, then very quickly they run out of options and you can close them down. This is the same with spears as well. And um, therefore there is an additional piece of advice for the person using a katana or a, uh, any shorter weapon essentially than the uh, rapier. And that is try and get the rapierist into a space where they can't keep moving away, they can't keep running away, they can't keep moving around. If you can back them into a tree, a wall, whatever, a bush, um, where they can't keep moving back, your job of closing in or manipula manipulating their weapon is going to become a lot, lot easier. Okay, so there we go. It's all about controlling distance and controlling the bind, and sometimes using the environment to assist those two things. I hope this has been useful. Obviously, I'm not a Japanese swordsmanship um, aficionado, 
but I am a European swordsmanship aficionado, and the fact is that the considerations for fighting against a rapier are the same of, uh, whether it's a Langmesser or a Katana, and ironically, for the Katana user, the best place to look for anti-rapier techniques is in European sources, because they were where you had anti-rapier techniques. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching. I am Matt Easton and I will continue to be. I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Check out the links below, watch my previous videos if you haven't done already, and I hope to see you again. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.